up to part two of our demo uh, project. So let me remind you that, of course, at each stage, you'll find a copy of the uh, file that I'm using as a reference and my copy-paste file, as I call it, up in Blackboard. So you can use that to help you follow along as well. So the next topic we're going to introduce, <clears throat> remember those table-level check constraints that you did back in uh, SQL Server? Right? The idea was that you can do uh, a check constraint on an individual field in a database table, but what if it was something that involved uh, logic based on multiple fields? Well, then you had to do a table level check constraint. Well, we have something similar with iValidatable object. This interface allows us to do validation of logic where we access multiple properties inside the object, inside the class, and much more advanced code as well that we can, that we can do simply with an annotation. So I'll remind you again that we have a lot, a lot of validation was possible just using the data annotations themselves, things like required. We saw the use of regular expressions. We saw the use of ranges, et cetera, et cetera. So that gives us a whole gamut of things that we can do on individual properties. But what if we want to do something a bit more complex that you can't just do with one of these annotations, especially, as I said, if it involves multiple properties? Well, that's where I'm going to come up here I'm going to say that this class is going to implement iValidatable object, right? And of course it doesn't, so, you know, uh, if I come here, I can ask it to implement it, and it will add this chunk of code, usually right at the bottom, yeah. Okay, so it's not complete yet, it's just throwing a not implemented exception, right? But the idea is, after the other validations are done, then this will have a chance to run. Now this can only happen on the server side, unfortunately, but that's something we can live with, okay? So the example I thought of is, okay, we're entering a date of birth, right? For the patient, you know, just if somebody accidentally, right, uh, is entering data and not really thinking about it, they might accidentally pick the wrong date, right? And what if they pick a date in the future? Well, we know for certain that that can't be valid. I mean, it might be today if you're entering data for a brand new baby that was just born, I suppose, but it certainly can't be a future date. So how would we go about that? So I've, just, I've got some comments along with this to explain a little bit about it. I'm just going to throw all my code in here. Okay. All right. So what we're going to do then is, see, we actually have to create this string array, right, uh, in order to say where the message should show up, okay? So what we have is some logic. If our date of birth, and we're using get value or default again because it is a nullable date of birth, right? So get value or default returns a, a, a standard date time instead of a nullable date time. So if it's in the future, so it's greater than date time today, right? Well, that's not valid, right? So we're going to add a validation result that the date of birth cannot be in the future. So this next argument, well, this is really about the fact that we want that to show up in the user interface in relation to a given piece of information. Which one? The date of birth, right? So it's a little awkward in a sense that we have to create this new uh, date of birth business in order to actually, uh, as a string array, in order to say where it shows up. Now, if you don't want to do that, if you don't provide this argument, it will just show up in the validation summary at the top of the page. So this is a quick example of doing this validation. Let me bring up the actual, um, for example, the actual edit page here in, uh, or create, either one would be fine, in patient. Maybe I'll use create, right? So we might not have noticed it before, but right at the top, inside the opening form tag, this is ASP validation summary, right? So anything that isn't specifically for one field Okay, we'll appear here in the summary right at the very top of the page, right? Now, in our case, though, we want it to be the validation for date of birth. So that's where the actual message would show up, whether it's on a create or an edit, right? I don't have to change anything in the, in the view. We just do it in this one spot, and it will be dealt with everywhere. So let me just run this once more. Okay, so we're up and going. So if I come in, it's easier for me to do, ah, oh, it doesn't matter. I'll do the create. All right, so if I come down here, so notice we don't have any date information because it's a new record. But if I were to pick, say, tomorrow, for example, now if I click Create, right, I'm not getting that error message. Why? Because that doesn't happen until we hit the server, right? So 
to save me filling out all this just to get the data to the server, I'm going to go back to the list and show you on the edit page. If I come in here to edit, because I can, uh, oh gosh, <laughs> pick somebody who is pretty old. Okay. Uh, there we go. Definitely in the future. So I'll click save. Now you see, it actually went to the server and came back. Ooh, yeah, so if there's a problem on the server, if it isn't satisfied with the validation, remember, everything is double checked there, then it comes back and is redisplayed to show the error message now, right? That's the one sort of limitation of this iValidatable object interface <clears throat> is it only happens on the server. Now, truth is, of course, if the browser can't support doing it client side, everything has to wait till it goes to the server and comes back anyway. So it's really not the end of the world. It just maybe seems a little odd at times that you can fill everything else out and it doesn't complain until you actually submit it the first time. Uh, but it still does the job. It gets the job done. So it's a very powerful way that we can add more complex validation to our data model than we can do with just the data annotations themselves. Okay, so that's one thing that we needed to talk about. And of course, you know, in the code that we're working with here, you can access all the properties in here and you can do multiple ifs. You could do this test and that test and something else, and you can do a whole bunch of uh, different validations uh, all in the same uh, uh, area here as we implement I validatable object, right? Okay, well, we're gonna leave that alone for now. I'm gonna come back to the controller because we mentioned the fact that sometimes things have gotta to come to the server to be fully evaluated and validated. Well, that's great on the server, but what actually happens then as we process this code and leading up to it, what happens when there's a data from the actual database, something we don't even find out about until we try to actually save data there, right? Well, we're gonna deal with all of those issues right now. So let's just have a look. Maybe I'll use the patient controller as our example here, because that's the one we already consolidated all of that code to prevent, or sorry, to uh, consolidate the uh, select lists, right, to populate the drop-down lists for our uh, doctors in relation to the patient, right? So we've already done quite a bit of work here. So I just want to point out that in, we looked before, right, that we have a single index, we have a single details. By the way, I'm going to go control MO on the keyboard here, just shrink everything down, right? So we have an index action, we have the details action, one each of those. The other ones come paired. There's a get for create and a post for create the get for edit, the post for edit, get and post for delete, right? You might say, well, why does it say delete confirmed? We'll get there in a minute. Okay, so for each of these paired operations, the, the get and the post for create, for example, right? What we're gonna see here, right, is uh, this anti-validate, anti-forgery token, okay? So that is really here for cross-site uh, request forgery attacks, okay? It prevents those attacks. The token is automatically injected into the view, right, by the form tag helper, and it's included when the form is submitted to the user, right? The token is validated by the validate entry forgery token attribute. So when it comes back, right, it is able to confirm that yes, indeed, this is not a cross-site request forgery, right? Because you're giving me back the valid token that I put in the page. Right, so that's one thing that's going on here. As well, of course, down here in the comments, we note that, uh, remember we talked about the overposting attacks, right? Um, okay. To prevent overposting attacks, right? We wanna be specific about the properties that we're going to bind to. And that happens here in our whitelist. That we're only binding to these properties. So if somebody gets into the post and actually modifies the data being sent to the server, they might be able to guess uh, a name value pair, right? Something that is an actual valid field name that is in the database, but not exposed to the client at this point in time, uh, and maybe make a change to the data, right? That's called an overposting attack. So that's where the bind attribute comes in. It's a whitelist and that we limit that no, only these properties of the object that we're building can be uh, um, have value set from the data coming from the client. Okay, so there's a lot of protection here already, right? Let's look at how the logic is happening inside the post for create though. Here, okay, model state is valid. So this checks all the validation again on the server, right? So here is where 
our iValidatable object was came into play, right? Not only did it double check all the other validation requirements from our data annotations, it also executed that. And so we determined that the model state was not valid, right? And then what we do then, we skip over all this. And so we're basically going to redisplay the view. Now the view, okay, it will have this patient object will have the validation information added, right? That gets added into the view so that all the error messages will uh, be presented when it's redisplayed to the user. And we're calling our populate dropdown list so we have the data necessary for the dropdown. In fact, the patient that was built, okay, as the data came in and we constructed this patient object, it is used to make sure that when we're redisplaying the form with all these error messages, that actually the same option, okay, the same doctor is selected when we redisplay the one that the user picked or chose out of the dropdown list just a minute ago. That's a quick overview of what's happening here inside the uh, post for create. So, I mean, the get was quite simple, right? We just prepared the data for the dropdown list. And we present a blank view, right? In the post, we have all the data coming in. We build the patient based on the data coming in using our whitelist protect for overposting attack. We check the validation as best we can. And if it's all good, then we add the patient and save changes and we go back to the index. If there is a validation issue, then we just redisplay the page showing all the validation error messages once again, right? The question is, what about the database, okay? Well, as a general rule, anytime we attempt to change data in the database, that should be wrapped in something like a try-catch. And we don't see that here right now, do we, right? We should have a try catch and the catch should check for any possible exceptions raised by the database. And then that way we can actually handle them individually giving customized messages back to the user, okay? So how would we go about that? Well, let's uh, just look at using this for an, as an example. I'm gonna come in here and we're gonna use the uh, little uh, code snippet. So I'll just go try tab tab, right? And that gets me in my basic try catch structure. So what do we want to try? Well, basically this entire if, okay? I'm gonna move that inside the try, right? That way we try to uh, update the database, but we're still gonna check if it's valid, right? We aren't skipping that step whatsoever, but that might as well be here inside the try. And if it succeeds in updating the database, good. It redirects back to the action and we're all good. But what now we're handling is what if, when we call save changes here, what if there's an error raised by the database, an exception thrown, right? Then we'll come down to our catch block and we'll be able to handle that. Now, what we can have work with a general exception, but the truth is the one that we're gonna be concerned about is not so much that as it is the DB update exception, right? Database update exception, and we normally give a uh, something like uh, X or EX or DEX, maybe I'll use DEX, right, for database exception. And then that allows us to examine the exception object itself, right? It's just complaining we haven't used it yet, but we're gonna get to that in a moment, right? So what I can do is, well, thinking about OHIP, what might the database complain about? Well, one of the things that we've added in the database that isn't reflected, that can't be determined ahead of time is, ooh, what about that unique constraint on the OHIP number? No two people can have the same OHIP number. Well, it's not until we try to save the data to the database that we can determine that it's a duplicate, right? So we end up might having code that looks a little bit like this. Instead of just throwing the exception, I'm going to check, okay, my DEX and my exception object, the get base exception. This is a good approach because it handles whether uh, the error message, you know, is in the exception or in an inner exception or in an inner exception of the inner exception doesn't matter right it'll get it okay and we can check the message and then i can check for specific wording okay unique constraint failed patient ohip right you know if i want to i could just go with unique right or ohip for that matter right but this will catch it okay there's only one unique constraint, so I'm gonna leave this alone. There's only the one to worry about. So add model error. Now, where do I want it to show up? I want it to show up beside OHIP, right? And then my message will be specific, unable to save changes. Remember, you cannot have duplicate OHIP numbers, right? So that is what I'm going to say is the feedback to the user, 
okay? And by adding this model error to model state, the model state is returned along with the view to the client. So on that trip back again to redisplay the same data that they've entered so far, right? This will be bundled up with it and then show. Now, if we don't, as down here, see, we have an empty string for that first argument, right? And that is actually uh, the key, okay? So if the key is empty, then it goes into the summary at the top, right? So if it wasn't due to this unique constraint, I can say, unable to save changes, try again. And if the problem persists, go for coffee and try again, right? Or go see your system administrator. Go bug somebody else, but don't bug me, right? And that is a much better way to handle the situation. That way I should get a proper error message, okay? If I try to create a record with an identical uh, OHIP number as we already had, okay? Now, following that, we're still going to populate the drop-down list. That always has to be done before we return back to the view because we have to have the data in place for the uh, select control, right? And then we return view patient, and then all the model state goes along with it, and the patient will get a full picture of why they were not able to create, even if the error message was something coming from the database. So eventually, you might add more and more catches. Remember how try catch works? You can have a catch for one type of exception specifically, so you know what it is you're looking for. And then if you don't get that one, try the next one and the next one and the next one that you might expect to happen, right? Okay, now notice we never have to worry about the try catch in any of the get, right? The get actions because we don't change data in a get action. We only do it in a post. So coming down further, right? The get for patients, nothing to do, right? It's perfectly fine. We've already updated this. So we uh, provide the data for our drop-down list. That's good. In the post, here is where we're going to do some extra work, right? Now look at that. Okay, we already have a try catch here. Excellent. Okay, so the logic here, of course, again checking for overposting, right? We have our white list and so on and so forth. Our validate anti-forgery token. Okay, so first thing we're checking is. If the ID doesn't match the patient ID, then somebody was definitely mucking around in the data that's being posted up, probably with a tool like Fiddler again. So we're just going to say, hey, that doesn't make sense. We're going to return a not found, right? If the model state's valid, then we can try it, right? So we're going to try to update the database and save changes. Now look at this. We already have a catch. Update concurrency exception. Ooh, so that's one that's going to come into play later on when we actually are using a timestamp and so on, right? If there's a concurrency exception, that's one thing we might look for, and then we can give a specific error message, right? So how would we do that? Well, you know, they've made an attempt here in the scaffolded code, uh, but, you know, later on, we're going to see that we should probably improve upon this messaging that's happening, right? And we will eventually do that. But for now, let me skip over that one. And I'm going to show you that we can add another catch. I can just say catch. What do I want to catch? I want to catch my DB update exception. And again, I'll just call it dex. And, you know, essentially, I can put the exact same code I had for the create process, right? In the, oh, sorry, down here in the catch. Again, I, I don't need it all. I'll just have the uh, unique because I only have one unique constraint. OHIP number cannot be duplicated. If that wasn't the issue, then I'll just give a general message saying, hey, try again, talk to your system administrator. All right. And once more, we do our populate dropdown list and so on. Right? Uh, the extra thing we do want to think about here, the way it scaffolded it, okay, this return redirect to the index, right? I would prefer to have this, and it works better in most circumstances. I'm going to cut it out of here. So remember to do this yourself and put it in the try, right? So in the try, after we've successfully saved changes, that's when we want to redirect back to the index, okay? All right. And then we check for our two exceptions, our DB update exception, after our concurrency exception. Then we're free to then populate drop-down lists and redisplay it if there's a database error. Okay, let's run it so far with these two in place. Okay, so we've added this try-catch approach to both the edit and the create procedures. I wanted to get both of them in place. 
because it's so much easier to edit than it is to create. I don't have to fill out all the darn fields, but on your own, you should test that they both work. So, oh, actually, let me go back to the list for a second. Now, see, I took the darn OHIP number off, right? So that's okay. I'll edit Fred Flintstone. I'm gonna copy Fred's OHIP number. I'm gonna go back to the list and let's edit Wilma. I'm gonna give Wilma Fred's OHIP number. So now this should be a duplicate in the system. But when I click save, there we go. Unable to save changes. Remember, you cannot have duplicate OHIP number. All right, it works, right? Think about what's happened. That went right to the database. The database threw the exception. It came back, we identified it, and now we've given the user exactly the feedback that they needed, right? Excellent, we'll go back to the list. Uh, let me, I'll edit Barney Rubble. Let me point out this, okay? I'm gonna give Barney Fred's, because <laughs> I still have it in my paste buffer. What if I have other validation errors here, right? Uh, take out all that stuff, click save. Now notice what's happening, because these are checked on the client side, right? They don't happen until we go to the server, right? Oh, sorry, they happen right away, but the OHIP doesn't happen until we go to the server. Sorry, I got that backwards. You know what I mean, okay? That's what I get for uh, doing this when it's uh, <laughs> so late in the day. Okay, uh, let me do one more thing. Uh, let me change this again to something in the future. Click save and see, we still haven't gone to the server yet. Okay, so when we get this, I'll put this, uh, what is it, Barney? Rubble, might as well put it back, those values to what they were. Okay, now I don't see any problems anywhere. I'll click save, look at that. The date of birth cannot be in the future. So that shows, okay, we finished all the, uh, everything the validation checks we can do on the client. We send it to the server, right? But remember what happens on the server here. We came in to the edit process, okay? To the post for edit, okay? It found yet yeah, the patient ID matched. It checked this, if model state is valid, and it wasn't, right? It failed that I validatable object, the logic we put in there. So it didn't even try to save it. So there was never a chance for the database to tell us about that problem, right? It just came back Return the patient in the view after populating the dropdown list, right? Okay, that's exactly what we would expect. So let me uh, go back to something that would be a valid. I can't remember what it was. I should maybe just cancel. Oh, well, it's okay. I'll just change the value. Uh, 1999. Okay. All right, so that is going to give us another chance to save. And then finally, Okay, so it got back the local checks here on the client side. It got through the check on the server side for validation, went to the database, and now the database error has been raised. And then we still can't save these changes because we're violating something. We're violating the unique constraint on the OHIP number. Okay, look at all we've accomplished here with a relatively a very small amount of code, right? Okay, let's get back to Visual Studio again. I'm going to stop writing just because it gives me a lot more screen real estate to work with. Let's finally do the delete, okay? Now again, the get for delete is really nothing for us to worry about at this stage in time. I should mention that the technique I'm about to show you here for the delete is actually different. It's different from what you'll find in that 10 part online tutorial, right? In there, they, they created basically uh, a spot to show the message on the page in a different way, but I'm going to take advantage of the built-in uh, model state instead, right? It's just an alternate approach from what's in the tutorial. But I think that you'll find that it's quite a useful approach to do as well. But I did promise we'd talk about this. How come this is delete and this is delete confirmed, right? Well, remember that you cannot have two methods in a class that have identical signatures. That means the same name and the same parameters, right? So if I had both of them called delete, because in this case, it's just the ID. The fact that one's a nullable int is, an, is not enough of a difference for them to be different signatures. So we would violate that general rule about how you put together classes. You know, if it weren't for that, it wouldn't be a problem because this goes to the get request. This is marked that it's for an HTTP post, right? 
but we can get around that. We could do it in two ways. And this is mentioned in the online tutorial. We could just add in a not used parameter of some sort, right? If we just wanted to have the word delete here instead of delete confirmed, I could just throw in a parameter that I never actually use. It just sits there doing nothing, but it satisfies the requirement of having a different signature. This is probably a more professional approach. And since the, it's built into the tool to be able to do this, okay, in this annotation, we can also say action name, right? So if they remember it's controller, then action, and then the ID. So if the action name is delete, okay, we're saying, okay, if it's a post and the action name is delete, this is the code, this is what we want to do. This is the code we want to direct it to, right? It wouldn't even matter at this you know, stage if I called it delete confirmed, I could call it uh, Fred's eats peanuts on Friday, right? And it would still work. If the post came in with the action name delete. I apologize for that. That was my wife. And you know what? A rule of a happy marriage is when your wife calls you, you don't just ignore the call. So I had to tell her that I was busy recording. I'll call you back. Anyway, all right. So down here to the post for delete, right? Uh, what we're going to do now that we actually have it identified that if it's action name delete and it's a post, this is where it comes, right? Let's, what are we going to do about this? Well, again, we want to try catch and so on. Now, in this case, this is first of all checking, is this patient already been deleted, right? Is it still there? Okay. And that, okay, this is fine. Return problem. And he said that it is no, uh, maybe we should change this message. That's a little bit cryptic. That's what the scaffolding gave us. Uh, maybe we'll say uh, patient is, has already been deleted, something like that. Okay. All right. So that's fine. So that's a good check. All right. Then what do we do? Well, basically we go and we get the patient with find async, right? And that gives us our quick and easy, uh, by the way, find async is extremely efficient, right? If you know the primary key value, it uses the index of the primary key to just go and locate this one record. It's much use quicker than using any kind of a sort of a where clause approach or uh, the other approaches that we have. The limitation is it only works, okay, with the, the primary key. All right, so we go and we get the one patient, okay, because we do have to get it there. As long as it's not null, we call dot remove. Dot remove for this patient removes it from the patient's collection. Then when we call save changes, that will actually do the delete then, right? Finally, we redirect back to the index action. So how are we going to arrange this inside of a try catch? Well, this is what I prefer to do. I'm going to come after the fact that we go and we get the patient object. So here I'll add my try tab tab, right? That gives me my try catch structure. So what am I going to put inside here? I'm going to put this if structure and actually we're going to put all this code, all of it, control X, control V. We're going to put it all inside the try, right? So we have our final check that about it being null, we remove, we call save changes, and we go back to the index. We try all that. If that's good, we're done. Okay. Now our exception in this case, right? Um, really, I, I can't think of a reason, okay, why we would have this exception, right? So this is the code I would use in a situation like this. Uh, there's really no reason the delete should fail, right, if you can talk to the database. So I'm just going to add a generic message. Again, it will go up here in the summary at the top of the page. Unable to delete record, try again, and if the problem persists, go see the system administrator, right? Don't bug me, go bug somebody else. Okay, so I don't even really need to examine the exception object, the messages in it. You know, it's not going to do me much good, right? All right, now, that's fine, but wait a second. We're going to get an error because... We aren't always returning a path. Remember, there was a return at the end here now. So what we want to do is we want to return back to the delete view and pass the patient back again, right? Remember, we went, we got the patient, okay? We can pass it to the patient view just as we do with the get request. Remember, in the get request, we come in here, we ID the patient, right? We go and we get the patient first or default, okay? By the way, the reason why we aren't using that find async, you can't do a dot include with this very efficient find async, right? And since we wanted to include the doctor, right, then that's what we're going to do. Now, 
then again, come to think of it, this is the query we should be using as well, because we do want to, if we're going to be redisplaying now, right, we want to make sure that we actually have the doctor included. Otherwise, it goes to show the full name of the doctor, and it won't have it. Okay, so that's another change we have to make with this, because we're going to redisplay the page to show the message, right? So we're just taking advantage of the fact that the model state, we can add this model error and go back to the page and show it. The only problem that's left, this again, a, a different approach from what's in the tutorial, but what the problem left is the delete view has nowhere to show this error message. Ah, it's built into the system. We have the model state, we can take advantage of it, but we have to tell the view to show it. So what I would normally do is come into patients I'll just prove that to you. If I come to the delete view, see there's no validation summary here, right? Nothing to show the message. We can grab it from either the editor or create. Okay, here's that one line of code, right? Where the summary message is shown at the top. I'm gonna to copy that from the edit page, coming to the delete page. I would typically put it maybe right above this horizontal rule or right below it, whichever you prefer. It doesn't really matter too much. I'm gonna put it above. So now we've added a spot here where it's going to grab the validation summary and show it on the page. Okay. Without that, the message might be sent to the page, but it would never be displayed. So <laughs> that's the thing to remember. And it often happens. Students, they're almost finished. They get all this code in place. They go and they test and oh, there's nothing happening. All right. So let me just save all these changes. Now, the trouble with this, there's nothing going to prevent me from actually deleting this. Right, so I'm never going to get to see this message come up because I won't be prevented from deleting the record. That is a different situation when it comes to the doctor, right? So uh, maybe even before I demonstrate that, let's come to the doctor controller and we're going to make some changes there as well. Okay, so I'll, I'll just get them in place and we'll talk about them because it's a repetition of exactly what we did in the patient controller except for how we handle the delete. Okay, so just quickly going over the changes we've made so far. In the create post here, I just added the try catch block. There's nothing really in the database. Uh, there's no unique constraint on the doctor and so on. So I'm just going to throw in this here to check for a DB update exception. If there is one, we'll just give that general message. Something went wrong, talk to the system administrator, and that's all we can really do because there's no reason in the database why we shouldn't be able to create a doctor, right? There's no constraints that would interfere with that. Coming down to the edit post, okay, all we did is we added the catch here, right? Except that I also moved this line up inside the try to the redirect back to the index action, okay? That's the return uh, uh, action of this method, right? If everything goes well, we'll just go back to the index. Okay, so those are the quick changes I made so far. This one gets more interesting because there is a reason why we might not be able to delete a doctor. Remember, we restricted cascade delete, right? We said, no, you're not gonna be allowed to delete a doctor if the doctor has any patients assigned, right? So I'm gonna take the same kind of approach I did before. After we go and we get the doctor, I'm going to put my try, tab, tab, right? And then we're going to uh, put all of this code inside the try block. Okay, don't really need that white space. Right? Don't forget as well that we want the same version, oops, sorry, uh, of the link query, right? Oh, we don't even have an include, include, so I guess we don't really need it. Yeah, never mind. Uh, if you have an include, you wanna make sure you change this to make sure you're doing the include, but we don't have one. Okay, so there's our catch, right? Now the catch is where we get uh, something a little bit more interesting going on, right? Because there's possibly a reason now for the exception, what we're going to do is we're going to check specifically for the reason why we were not able to delete the doctor, right? So we'll look for foreign key constraint failed, okay? That, that works with SQLite, or we could just even say foreign key, but I mean, that would be okay. And then we can say unable to delete doctor, Remember, you cannot delete a doctor that has patients assigned, right? If that's not contained in the base, uh, in the message, in the base exception, 
then we don't know why, so we'll just give our generic message if the problem persists, right? You can go ask somebody for help. All right, so that should give us a much better performance now in terms of selecting the doctor. Or sorry, deleting the doctor, right? Ah, there's my underlining happening because what did I forget? Remember, we need to do two more things. Got to make sure that after the catch block, we return the view and give the doctor back again, right, to the view. All right, there we go. And last but not least, we have to make sure there's a summary span to actually show the message. So coming down to doctors, I could come into any of them. I'll just use the edit, copy the validation summary span out of here. Or div, I should say. It's not a span, it's a div. Come into here and add it right to the view so that now the delete view can show the validation message. Okay, I think we're ready to give this a try. Now we aren't done. There's more work we're going to do uh, in terms of improving the controllers, but this was the uh, most important part, getting these try catches in place. Right? So we've already seen the effect in patients. Let's come here to doctors. So I know Gregory House has got some patients. So if I click delete, I get my chance. Okay, are you sure you want to delete this? I'll say delete. And there we go. Unable to delete doctor. Remember, you cannot delete a doctor that has patients assigned. Yay, success. Okay. Now, because there's no other validation besides what's already here on the client side, right? Like things like that, these are required and so on. Yeah, I, there's nothing else to show. There's no database error that I'm going to generate by trying to do anything else. So there's no point trying to demonstrate it either. So the key thing here, because this is a parent, right, and there's referential integrity constraint on here that we cannot delete a doctor that has patients. Now, Albert, this one here I added earlier. Can I delete this one? Yes, I can. And there it is gone, right? I confirmed, yes, I did want to delete that doctor. And I was able to do so because there were no patients assigned to that doctor. Okay, so that's basically the most important part. But you know what? There's other improvements I just want to quickly talk about as well in terms of uh, changes we'd want to make to the controller. But I just noticed how long this video is, so I think I'll stop and start to get the last topic in place.